Well, we're going through the book of Acts, and we have come the only God-inspired book on the first Christians. And Luke has a very sophisticated recording. Uh, Luke, the beloved physician who uh, travels with them on the second and third missionary journeys. Luke, who is a, not only a doctor, he's a cr tremendous historian. And as he has researched these things to find out what is truly going on, that he comes along and he tells these great truths. The big question is, how can a bunch of followers of a itinerant Jewish rabbi by the name of Jesus of Nazareth end up a primary Gentile movement throughout the Mediterranean world in the heart of the decadent capital of Rome itself? Luke answers that. And Luke explains to them, and particularly, the church moving out in the face of huge opposition. And this part of the book, the beginning, remember, at the beginning of Acts 1, Jesus before his ascension. Christ goes up, the Spirit comes down, and the church goes out. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that's a good outline of the book of Acts. You see what's happening in Jerusalem with the Jewish followers of Jesus. And then we find Philip the eunuch in Samaria and Judea and to the ends of the earth. There are really three different Pentecosts. There is, of course, the Pentecost, the Jewish celebration in Jerusalem. And then throughout the book, you'll find out people who have heard of Jesus, but they've never heard of the Holy Spirit. And God sends his spirit upon pig-eating Gentiles pagan Gentiles, they begin speaking in tongues and they say, they belong. And God is moving faster than theology, their theology. He's moving so fast and they are trying to follow along and say, what is the Lord doing? And the most remarkable thing is that God is inviting into holy history, the history of Israel and the Messiah, the Gentiles. And they need to come not on keeping the Jewish law, but on grace of Christ alone. And this really upsets the Jewish followers of Jesus. And we find out it's not the law. In fact, we in Presbyterianism, the Reformed faith, is a rediscovery of this sola fide, by faith alone, sola gratia, it's by grace alone. It's not by good works, it's not by being brilliant, it's not by the guy up front in the black robe, it's about all of us who belong through grace in Christ. And as we come along, we see this next move, this place of finding themselves surrounded by a hostile crowd. How do you handle it when people are against you? How do you act when they do that? I heard of a gentleman up, uh, on, uh, up I-5 going up uh, central California. They went into a, a diner. He was a cross-country trucker, and he was sitting down having his lunch. And all of a sudden, four members of a biker game, whether Hell's Angels or not, came in. They saw him sitting there at the counter. One of them went over, picked up his coffee and drank it. Another one picked up his burger, took a bite out of it. Another one put his cigarette out in his french fries. The driver just looked at him and got up and wiped his mouth and paid the lady, gave her a tip and got in his truck and drove off. The biker said, he wasn't much of a man, was he? And she said, no. He wasn't much of a driver. He just ran over four motorbikes on the way out out there. You know, that. How do we respond when people come against us? Well, in Acts 10, as Ben was reading, we have this marvelous story of this move of God's hand that we see in Acts 8. Peter raises Tabitha, Dorcas, from the dead, a girl who dies, just like Jesus does, the son of Jairus. Synagogues, oh, same Jesus, doing the same things, now through you and me. And then it moves ahead until we find this place of where Cornelius, he's a centurion. What's a centurion? Well, cent they are over a hundred soldiers, Roman soldiers. They're not like NCOs, non-commissioned officers. They're like staff sergeants, and they're overseeing. He has seen a lot of actions, like, but he's a God-fearer. What that means, he, he's... Pagan, he's Roman, polytheistic, but he, he's seeking out this one God, and he gives away his money to help them. And he, in the middle of this prayer, all of a sudden, the Lord shows up and says, Cornelius, God has heard you. Now go to Joppa. Interesting. 
There's a guy named Peter up there, and he's staying with a tanner. You know what a tanner is? They're the ones that take care of the hides. In rabbinic law, a tanner could never be clean because they clean not only with blood, they use pig skins, they use everything skins. And it's interesting that Peter is with a tanner when he calls. And so Peter goes outside, he comes to this house, he is met with them, he's going up on top of the roof. It's, it's cool there and they have normally a canopy and he's really hungry while they're making him his a kosher meal. And this vision of a bunch of pork chops and crab dip and bacon sandwiches coming down and God says, eat. And Peter goes, no way. I've been kosher my whole life. There's no way I'm going to do this. And God says, what I say is clean is clean. He falls back to a trance. It happens a second time. You know, when God does two things in scripture, it means it's kind of irrevocable. Well, you'll see in the Old Testament very often, God will say this, and then he'll say it again. That means the missiles are out of the silo. There's no calling them back. And in this new holy history, this Heil Geschichte in the German, what God is saying is, I'm bringing the Gentiles in and there is no going back. And so all of a sudden, in the middle of this, while Peter is wondering what this vision is, the story continues with this next passage here in Acts 10. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision which he had seen might mean, whoa, behold, the men that were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood before the gate. And they called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. Now, Peter was pondering the vision. The spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. Arise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I'm the one you're looking for. What's the reason for your coming? And he said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was spoken well of by the whole Jewish nation. He was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he called them in to be his guests. On the next day, he rose and went off with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and had called together his kinsmen and his close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at Peter's feet and worshipped him. And Peter lifted him and said, whoa, 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 stand up. I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate or to visit with any one of another nation. But God has shown me I should not call any man common or unclean. So when I was sent for you, I came without objection. I asked them, why have you sent for me? This is the word of the Lord. So we see that God is moving so fast. Very often is it not true for us spiritually as we go through life? It's one thing, you know, discipline is postponing gratification. Do you raise your threshold of pain? When you're working out, you know, you run farther than you usually do, a few more pounds, whatever. You don't eat that second piece of pie because you're so disciplined. <laughs> You know, being a parent is the same thing, only different. You raise your threshold for your kid's pain. You don't rescue them. You love them and you help them. You know, I mean, you don't stand by and abdicate your role. But when you say, no, you're going to do your studies now. No, you're going to clean your... You're raising your threshold for their suffering. Because you, know, because you love them, you wish their highest. And very often with we in the church... And I know this as a pastor, I, I have so many things. I thought by now I'd quit this sinning thing, but Carolyn says I still do it. I don't know, but it's being able to watch our brothers and sisters as they struggle in their journey with Christ, being able to say, no, that God can continue and to move in this way. And Peter, after this, we find out the beginning of the book of Acts is Peter. It's now switching over to, as we saw last week, 
the Rabbi Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul. Peter is the head of the Jerusalem church. Paul, the one taught by Gamaliel, the brilliant mind, is the one that's at head of the Gentile church. And Peter is now going through his final trials. We find in the next couple chapters that Herod Agrippa, this is the grandson of Herod the Great when Jesus was born. He killed James, the brother of John. Remember when Jesus said to them, remember, mama comes and says, Jesus, I want one of my sons at the right and one at the left. And a good Jewish mother. And Jesus says, can they drink the cup I'm going to? And they said, we will. And they did. James is killed, and it impresses and it moves the Jews, and so Herod Agrippa says he'll arrest Peter. Remember this great story? And he throws him in jail. Peter's in jail, but the church is in prayer, and they're praying for Peter. An angel of the Lord comes to Peter, we have time to go into this in detail, comes and says, get up, the chains fall, and he goes, follow me. Peter thinks he's in a dream, he's going, wow, that's heavy. And he steps outside and he realizes it's not a dream and he goes and he knocks on the door and the church is still praying for Peter and the girl opens the door and she goes, it looks like somebody. She doesn't let him in. And they go, who is it? They go, some guy saying he's Peter and Peter's going, it's me. And they let him in. In the 15th chapter of Acts, as the good Dr. Luke records it, the first church gathering, every form of government in any church can build its basis on the 15th chapter of Acts. There's a bishop run, Episcopalian, James, is the one who went and he hears these stories about the Gentiles. He says, it's my decision. It's congregational because those that are around her say yes. And it's presbyteros, it's elders, because the elders bear witness. Peter comes and says, these Gentiles, the Holy Spirit has come upon them. They were saying Jesus is the Messiah. They're wanting to follow him. And the church says, wow. And so what they say is, two things that's interesting. Still keep kosher as far as blood sacrifices that are given to the Roman gods and the Greek gods. If you and I went to get a burger today, you'd go down here to a local uh, worshiping of another god, and they would have been sacrificed, and it's in the market. Jesus has already said in Mark, the oldest of the Gospels, whatever enters the body leaves the body, and by this he declared all things clean. Paul says all things are clean to those who receive it in faith. There's no such thing as kosher or unkosher, dietary laws. This is amazing. Do you know why I think Saul of Tarsus met the risen Christ? Not because he said he saw him, this guy is a Jew of Jews. This guy is as orthodox as you get. And after he meets Jesus, he says, I'll take the crab dip. <laughs> what changed? Somebody might think that Jesus is the Messiah to say the law is gone with. And this is a powerful move of what God is doing. And as he continues to move and to show himself alive and to follow him. And you know, for all of us, it's a said. The love of God wants the best for us. The wisdom of God knows the best for us. But the power of God accomplishes this for us. And very often, God wants us to come to him in prayer. Always. Does he know? Yes. But he knows there's something when we come to him and cast our burdens upon him that we get closer to him. And not to be afraid of being honest with him in prayer because he knows what all of us in here and those watching are going to ask. But he says, come to me, come to me. And God delivers by this remarkable power. You know, I've told you before, uh, the two things I disliked in the ministry the most, having to let staff go and small caskets, standing over the bodies of dead children. And I have spent, I don't know how much money 55 years of studying and listening and researching and experiencing and asking and searching. And I can't tell you why God let James be executed and keeps Peter alive, except it's in his purposes. 
I can't tell you why this child lives and this one doesn't. I can't tell you why one person finds love and another one who is more deserving remains alone. I can't tell you why one investment goes and another goes broke. Why one business excels and someone working harder struggles on. Why one church explodes and is the flavor of the month and another really faithful ministry barely gets by. I can't connect those dots, but I can tell you this. God answers prayer. Amen. And he may answer in a way not that we wanted, but he has heard. He's not deaf, he's not weak, and he's not asleep at the wheel. Sometimes, as you've heard me say, it's like by intervention. These are the ones we like, like the parting of the Red Sea, or Peter raising the dead girl, or Jesus coming out of the tomb. Sometimes God intervenes. Sometimes it's interaction. God uses us. Like Moses, told by God to throw down his staff, and it becomes the rod of God. Samson told pick up a jawbone and he slays a thousand Philistines because of the spirit upon him. David picking up five stones. By the way, I think Martin Luther said, why did David use five stones? He said, so preacher could have five point sermons. <laughs> but very often Paul's thorn in the flesh. He's three times he says, Lord, take this from me. And God says, no, sometimes it's intervention. He strengthens you and me to go through it. Is Jesus in the garden. Father, I've asked everything. I've done everything you've asked. One thing I asked, take this cup away from me. And not my will, but thy will be done. And the father has to say to the son at least three times, no, no, no. You must go through this. And the other side is, you can go through this. I will see you through this. And the Lord will ask of you and me and of this congregation and everyone that follows him. And I believe particularly as the days wind up, who knows when Christ comes back? Maybe the year 3000, maybe he's into three, who knows? Christ could come back at any time, but you know what? He doesn't have to come back for the whole team to come back for you and moi. And as we walk with him and to be able to say, Lord, guide and lead, and we live in a society that is so filled of complaining. Is it not true? I read an interesting thing this last week from the Wall Street Journal that uh, statistically they've been studying that for the last 74 years, every year, Americans say society's getting worse. Ironically, if you look at the rubrics that you use for comparing what is morality within a country, that's not so. And they're trying to figure out, they think because the population has grown so much and because of the monomaniac of our media that we begin to believe that it is so much worse than it is. It's not to say there aren't bad actors out there. Oh my goodness. But it's also to say that sometimes you gotta step back and God says as the world continues on that he, from crisis to crisis until Christ returns. And for you and I, what we go through as the first Christians it's when we pray, Lord, deliver us from evil, we really mean, Lord, deliver us from pain. We kind of want, as Lewis said, a heavenly anesthesiologist. Take away this pain, God. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that prayer. It's just that God loves us too much to answer our prayer. I've been asked a lot of times in my ministry, can you talk God into second best? Well, I think you maybe can, but it's really, really hard. Because he loves you. He didn't like you. He loves you. He wants the very best for you and me. And as we get into, and you get into Acts 15, and as they are listening to each other and debating, when you and I have to go against people that we don't necessarily agree with, you define the problem, you listen to the person, and you bathe it in prayer. You define the problem. What's the issue at hand? Have you learned this yet when somebody really pushes your neuroemotional response that gets you really wound up? The first thing to do is do back feeding. Do you know what that is? Say back to them exactly what they said to you while you're regaining your composure. Say, so what you want to know is why I blah, blah, blah. And then don't editorialize and say, because you're dumb. <laughs> no, you just say it back to them. They're heard. Another little good trick to have, by the way, in conflict 
if you can't look at the bridge of their nose because they think you're looking into their eyes, and if you can't stare into their eyes, but if you look into someone's eyes and say, so what you mean is you've already devalued or de-elevated the adrenaline in the room significantly. So what is really the issue we're talking about? And then listen to the person. I uh, can't tell you the number of times people have won the argument and lost a friendship. There, uh, we, uh, when we were doing a, a practical theology, we brought in some people, and one of the people's uh, vice president for Oracle uh, brought in, and, and he came in, and we gathered together these pastors that we were teaching of uh, how you handle conflict. And he says he remembers one time someone in a gathering, a meeting up in San Francisco, he... The person said something, and he, the vice president, said, laughed and said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, and a chill went over the room. And nobody after that ever brought up a new idea, and he said, that comment probably cost me $10 million. The idea, when, when you chill somebody down, rather than being, say, listen to the person, and then the other, bathe it in prayer. And you and I know prayer is not a tactic to win. Prayer is a willingness to let God win. Prayers of faith to be able to say, Lord, you come in your ways. Peter will, as you continue to read in Acts, that he will be imprisoned and released. But the end of the book, we'll, we'll see. Paul is under house arrest. Peter's alive. But we know from history that Nero, when he starts to turn the blame on everything on these Christians, that Nero will arrest and have Peter arrested and he will have him brought before him and say, I am going to crucify you like I crucified Rome did your leader. And tradition says to us that Peter said, I am not worthy to die as my Lord. Crucify me upside down. And that's how he went into the presence of the Lord. But the mark of the early Christians, for the next 300 years, it would be illegal to be a Christian in Rome. Some of the emperors just kind of blew them off. Some of them had vicious persecution. Nero took the Christian. By the way, we don't have any record that any Christian died in the Colosseum because they were a warm-up act for the gladiators. Nero took some of the Christians, dipped them in wax, and burned them for his night games for a living candle. And the thing that bothered the Romans the most, Marturios, the witnesses, is they would say is these Christians, their incessant singing as they gather together before their death. And think, but the gladiators continued on. In the year 320 or so, Constantine becomes a Christian, but he doesn't mandate Christianity. Theodosius I in 395 will mandate it as the religion of the empire, which is stunning in those amount of years. But they still were doing the gladiators. And a particular bishop of Syria, Theodocus, who was a historian in 391, said what brought about the end of the gladiators was a particular old monk by the name of Telemachus. You may have heard this. He had heard what was going on, the roaring in the arena as people were crying out. And he saw these two men at this time. This is now, right, Christian Rome, right? And they still have the gladiators going. And he sees men killing each other for the amusement of this bored aristocracy. And Telemachus stands up and says, stop this. And the people around him told him to be the old man to be quiet. He lets himself down into the arena and he stands between two gladiators. And the people are booing him. And he, they knock him to the ground. And one of the gladiators turns and looking for a direction says, should I do thumbs up, let him live? By the way, thumbs down is not what they did. They covered their thumb, bury him. It wasn't this, it was this or this. And the stands covered their thumb and there was a slash of the sword and the old man lay dead. And a silence entered over the arena. And historians tell us that's the last time they can find a recording of a gladiator game. The 
The people were so convicted of what they just did that they stopped. The power of one witness to be able to stand and to show the love of Christ in that way. And so as we go forward into our life this next week, and God is out there preparing answers to prayers that we haven't whispered yet, to be able to go out and to find the people just to love them and to care for them, particularly the ones who are against us and say, how can I pray for you? How can I help you? You know, I never need to sell Jesus to anybody. If Jesus could show himself to moi, to me, he can show himself to anybody who wants to know. But to be able to just plant those seeds, to be a class act for the Lord, to celebrate the good, to weep at the bad, and to be able to be salt and light to this culture. That's what God has called us to be forever and ever. Therefore, I say, when you've done this to the least of these, as Jesus said, you've done it to me. Shall we pray? God, we thank you for our brothers and sisters, Lord, uh, on those first dusty roads that heard the good news. Thank you, Lord, that you poured your spirit upon people that they never thought they would be brothers and sisters with. And God, I pray for your church. I pray here, Lord, for Hollywood Press, God. Continue to uphold. Thank you, Lord, for the elders and the deacons and the staff. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Lord, and I pray that the, in the right time that there's a pastor out there right now, Lord, who's going to be a great match for here, Lord, and that he has a holy unrest right now where she does, Lord, and that they're going to be on the way to come here to guide and lead for the next chapter. But in the meantime, Lord, we know, we thank you. You do this a hundred times a day. You're so good at it. God, we continue on with the mission that we have. So, Lord, I pray now you'd come and give us the opportunity to stand and to tell others the good news of Christ. And may you receive all the glory and the honor. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.